Hey, I am Bob Cooney, and you know that. And I am here with um, a good friend of mine and uh, XR impresario. Is that the right word, Charlie? Charlie Fink, say hi. Hey, hey, everybody. So, um, so this is a, a live interview version of the Being Virtual show. It's the first one we've done. And the plan is to do more of these um, midweek and then leading up to the live show on Friday in the Americas and Europe and Saturday morning here in Australia and Asia, where I am on COVID lockdown in Melbourne, Australia. Charlie, where are you coming from to us from? Um, I'm in COVID lockdown in Los Angeles. How is it? Uh, how is the, you know, it's all we're talking about. So before we get into the the yeah. the future of work, which is being driven by the lockdown. How are things in Los Angeles? Um, it's hard to say because my little corner of Los Angeles is an area called North Glendale. Uh, and, you know, we're up on Verdugo Mountain. And so we're walking around the neighborhood. It's a very suburban neighborhood. And um, it seems hunky-dory. There's plenty of food in the grocery store. And... Uh, the air is clean and delicious, uh, you know, like it's um, New Year's Day. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to be appreciated by the quietness of it inside of a big city. But I haven't been – and, oh, and I drove through downtown the other day. It was, like, eerie, right? It was, like, neutron bomb eerie. Zombie apocalypse, um, right? Only without all the dead yeah, bodies. I mean, you know, even the homeless people seem to be staying in their tents, um, you know, and I, I, you know, there are food shortages. I, I think mostly it's that people are running out of money to pay for food. I mean, they literally don't have a dollar to pay for food. So forget about rent or your taxes or anything else. You know, we, we may be looking at here in the United States, 30 million people who, you know, can't afford food and are moving in with their relatives and, you know, are completely broken and disenfranchised and that's you know 10 percent of the country i mean this is crazy yeah so i think it's it's you know my thesis is and uh, you know you see more and more evidence for this every day everything that was about to happen or should have happened has now happened yeah right so uh, let's take telemedicine okay telemedicine has been about to happen for 25 years but and i always ask doctors about this right so why can't i do this flu thing by a video, I can't prescribe antibiotics, have to see the patient in person. We have all the insurance, wouldn't. Now they won't let me in the office. Yeah. And there's no talk about the insurance company or laying eyes on anybody. How about that? <laughs> it's was, it was a new law passed <laughs> or did people just give up on that particular scam? Yeah. And it's and it's amazing how, what do they say, necessity is the mother of invention, right? And 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 now what's happening is they're driving all of this. If people want to stay in business, they have to find new ways of working. And um, there's another saying, uh, um, uh, constraint drives innovation. And that's really what right. we're being. Well, the old necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yeah. Yep. The old cliche. Yeah. So um, so let's let's get right into it. Talk, first of all, so you're, you're yeah. teaching now at Chapman University, right? And and that's led to this this book thing. So how did this well, happen? You know, I was, I was mulling over what my next book was going to be. Um, I, I thought when this whole thing happens, you know, my principal sort of course source of income is consulting. And I thought, well, the first thing over board is advertising and consultants. Basically, if, if you have to lighten the load to make your gas last, you know, you're, you're going to kick off all the excess weight. Hey, that's why uh, we're making this show is because I've got all of this time because all my clients right. shut down, right? So, and I'm like, hey, let's do so something the, new. The good news, well, you happen to be in the one <laughs> sort of vertical inside of VR that is particularly vulnerable to this kind of um, disruption, whereas other companies are, are seeing a surge in business. Yeah. Um, so uh, that – uh, but I was thinking that I had no business. I was thinking, what are people going to need? I was thinking, what are the questions that are really pressing us that would bear research that could be useful? And and I was also looking at, you know, I had two classes at Chapman. One is a studio production class. So it's how do you make VR and AR without coding? So, you know, we're looking at all of the uh, 
codeless game engines, the AR machine platforms like the Blipper Builder, which by the way is quite good, um, that that allow um, people to make AR without having to write code or know how to build an app. Um, so that's that course, and you know basically people want to get exposed to the tools and, and then sit there and do it and get help. The other class is a much more advanced class. It's, well, I think it's advanced. It's all juniors and seniors. It's called XR Landscape. And it's really about the business of AR and VR and its place in our culture and society and what about technology and the development and adoption of technology. So both classes, fortunately, the kids had uh, Oculus Quests and could take them home. So we can conduct research uh, you know, using VR. So um, I pose to the kids, uh, you know, what are the tools out there for collaboration, right? What What is there other than Zoom? And is Zoom sufficient? You know, and why or why, or why not? You know, we're certainly become, becoming fast experts on, on what's wrong with Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> so is the um, Brady Bunch thing speaks to that because – for example, you know, conference calls are difficult for two reasons. One is people are distracted and multitasking and there's no body language. So you don't know when to stop talking or even who is talking. Yeah. Now, uh, Zoom calls do away with some of that, but some people do attend Zoom calls via mobile and there are many people who attend it and turn the picture off. Now, there's a good reason for that because of bandwidth and, and too many streams. I, I get that, but it also turns it into a conference call. Yeah. During multitask and search the web and surf the web. I, and again, I'm talking about education in particular, but I, I mean, look, we've all been in the workplace and seen people who are uh, – 100% focused on the job at hand. Hey, we've all been we've all been in live meetings around a boardroom and watched people sitting there. Right. Right. Some like, idiot is droning on, and thank God you have access to the internet or your smartphone or whatever. <laughs> no, I get it. I get why people do it. But, you know, you start for that reason, but then you do it for other reasons. Yeah. Because this guy is interesting and this is important, but, you know, this is the woman I love <laughs> who's, like, talking to me on, you know, whatever platform. Yeah. So, uh you know, it's that's that's the problem. In a live meeting, those things can't happen. And so, how are the students react? How did they react to that that it, challenge? How do we re it, react to that challenge? How did the it's, students? It's hard. students. I think there are a few platforms that might induce us to be more present. Um, I just did a virtual conference with that event farm. Uh, which used to do live events and is now pivoting to virtual events, um, put on using a platform by a company called Verbella that does 2D virtual worlds similar to like Second Life, but they're much easier to use than Second Life. And in that 3D virtual world, you know, you had to manage your avatar and you really had to kind of be present. And, and because it had spatial sound attached to this sort of 3D avatar, um, you did get something of a sense of presence. It's not quite what you would get in VR on a platform like Engage or in Oculus Venues, which has tremendous potential. Yeah. Because even though the thing playing out on stage is um, like a webinar, you are live in VR with the people around you. So I think that has a lot of potential, but there aren't enough VR headsets. I mean, the irony of this whole shutdown is, right, the greatest opportunity in the world for VR, and it's not ready for its close-up. And, and and if you wanted to go buy a headset, you can't. <laughs> it's like webcam. You know, webcams are sold yeah, out everywhere. I want, to, I, I want to push back against you can't. You can, but you're going to pay 20% more. Yeah, yeah. So you you can. And it can brand new in the box, but, you know, scalpers have bought them. Some people have come into inventory for whatever reason. If you go into Walmart or Amazon or um, – you know, eBay, you'll find people selling them new for, I don't know, my cousin just bought one for 650 bucks and he was agonizing, right? Yeah. Oh, I can't pay the extra 150 bucks. I'm like, well, what the hell? The next four weeks you're trapped. It's worth the extra 150 bucks. Yeah. every It's, it's, it's what, three bucks a day or something like that. Four bucks a day. It'll feel like a bargain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that's what I told him. I said, you know, you've got to think about this in different terms, right? The terms have changed. I would agree if you're like, oh, I'll wait a month. But this, this particular month that you're waiting is the one that contains all your free time. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so and and so how did you so you, you've challenged your students to go out and find all of these. So what we decided to do, what we decided to do was we were going to do research on all, all the different categories right, of, of remote collaboration and virtual conferences, right, because you have webinars, you have, um, you know, uh, uh, streaming services uh, like Facebook Live uh, and YouTube Live. Um, so, you know, which of these are the best and would you mix and match them? How would you, what would the ideal platforms have, right? So, um, you know, we have the the heart of the book is a directory of these hundred companies and what they offer. Wow. Um, it's a directory. It's not critical. We're not making a big chart and and ranking people. Um, but there is after the directory sort of our summary. And in the summary, we will talk about the companies that most that came the closest to what we think the ideal is and or at least were. Uh, successful in certain respects of creating uh, a virtual event that is more impactful than a Zoom conference, uh, you know, or enabling remote collaboration with a team that is, while not as effective as an in-person conference, effective enough in the context of the time and travel and trouble and money saved by doing it virtually instead of in person. Yeah. So again, as you said, things aren't going to snap back to normal uh, anytime soon, and certain things will will be changed, right? So more inspections will be remote, more conferences will be virtual, or live conferences will now have a powerful virtual companion, which will not be free. And some people will come to the event, but many more will now experience the virtual version, which will, I hate to say it will be lesser, but probably it will be in many respects, but in many other respects, it will be different and, and maybe better, you know, yeah. than, and, and, you know, better for our carbon footprint and better for our souls, you know, as many relationships as I've made, um, you know, how much I value my relationships with people from around the world, like ours, you know, we only see each other three or four times a year, and but I value those relationships greatly. And um, uh, I will, but we'll have to do something different yeah. because I'm not sure that the world can accommodate our lifestyles anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't think that I can take 25 plane trips a year anymore. Um, so I think those those are the kinds of things that'll change. Right? It's the end of the handshake. Mm. How long is it going to be before people are comfortable in an 80,000 person football stadium? Well, the recent research shows that 68% of the people polled said they're not going to go back to a sporting event until there's a, there's a, um, a vaccine. And 61% of sports fans said they wouldn't do it. And that really shocked me because, you know, I grew up in New York and Jets fans, you know, you know NFL, yeah. right? they're, they're rapping. Can you imagine what would keep a Jet fan from going to a game on a Sunday on yeah. they had to take it? Right. Exactly. But we found out. So uh, I, I think those those things will change, but but also watching a game on television is not bad. Yep. The the problem is the economics for the owners are all based on stadiums. Yeah. Uh, even though they get this tremendous amount of revenue from television, the money that really goes to the owner is from the stadium. Yeah. And and you know the the stadiums you know they make you know ten twenty million dollars a game. So you can't do away with live experience and have the same business model. So I think that's that's the challenge for professional sports or it goes to television and it's pay-per-view and it's really freaking expensive. Yeah. So, you know, you want to watch the Major League Baseball season. It's going to cost you eight hundred dollars. Instead of ninety nine dollars or whatever it was in the past. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, interesting. So, so you know, so I mean, look, by the way, I think so. I think things will get local, more local, and I think they will also get a lot more expensive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, food price of food is about to go through the roof. Yeah. Why do you think that? Uh, supply chain mostly. Yeah, I did um, see the hard. ice and pork factory shut down recently, which I'm not. Yeah, so, so that's going to push up the price of all meat. Yeah, for example. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, you know, truck drivers who work during the pandemic are going on premium for hazard pay. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, you look at what's happening in the Amazon distribution centers. I mean, the problem with the getting kicked out of Amazon is that um, 
you know, my son applied for is, is in real estate and, you know, nothing is happening. So, uh, you know, he was going to apply for a job at Amazon, you know, because you heard they were hiring. And, you know, he went uh, to the distribution center where they were taking applications, which was like 50 minutes away from him. And, you know, there were 10,000 people there. Yeah. And the recruiter said to him, yeah, we're hiring 100,000 people and we've got 4 million resumes. Yeah, my friend Michael Browning from Urban Air tried to, you know, he worked, he was on the phone with um, executives from Amazon trying to find a place for all his part-time and temporary workers in a chain of 150 retail trampoline parks um, trying to get them jobs. And I'm sure he wasn't the only one. And so, yeah, massive funnel. Yeah. So, so I, I think that, you know, and you see here that they've got, so, so that's what I worry about. We get to the other side of this and, okay, people have to work remotely, but that only accounts for one third of the workforce. So let's talk about the you things know? that, yeah. So let's talk about the things, like everybody's talking about Zoom and, and, and blah, 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 and Zoom's a great platform and everybody's using it, but there's other impact on the future of work that's going to be driven by this. And, and, and I know you follow all of this bleeding tech. Let's talk about robotics, right? Because I just saw a news thing of a, of a, yeah, a I've been hearing about robot. I know right? I've been hearing about robotics too, because you've got a factory, you've got a port factory, you know, maybe more of those jobs should be done by robots so that you've got fewer human, uh, employees who are vulnerable yeah. to, um, to disease and injury and, you know, all the other human infirmities. So, uh, I get that. I mean, I think that would have happened anyway. So as I said, you know, my thesis of Bellary. anything that was about to happen, happened, right? Remote education, this is another good one, was was thought of as a kind of a weird thing for homeschoolers. And, uh, you know, it's had some applicability, Coursera and Udemy, uh, particularly for people in the third world. And now there's some reputable programs in the United States that offer online degrees, but these are for advanced students who are extremely motivated. Yeah. Now your last book was called Convergence and, yeah. you know, and so somebody just posted and I, I didn't get, you didn't put your name. You must be on my Facebook group. So I, if you're on my Facebook group, by the way, and you're posting a question, put your name in the chat so I can see who you are because the restream platform that we're using for private groups doesn't send me your, your, um, yeah, and I'm not seeing the questions. Only yeah, but I'll, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and ask you this one. So the, the comment is virtually controlled robots. So the convergence of virtual reality and robotic, Tele, where do you tell a robot? Yeah. It's tele robotics, um, uh, virtual presence, uh, embodied, it's called embodied presence, right? So you're a robot you've got gloves on, you've got goggles on, you are virtually present there through a proxy mechanical, a uh, vehicle, I mean, it may not even be a vehicle, it may be a sensor or on a wall. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, that technology, which is really just happening now, although it's been talked about in places like Popular Mechanics for 40 years, it's really just starting to happen now. Um, and, and they're using it for dangerous work. Um, it's Broad applicability is, I'm not a manufacturing engineer, so I can't tell you how valuable one robot is versus another. Yeah. Um, but the tech is real and it's, 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 the prices come down and, you know, I, I have no doubt we'll see it implemented. But remember that it moves at the speed of a human. Yeah. Right. So if you want a robot that is going to make things in a car, you know, you don't want it to stop. Yeah, but that, stuff already, that stuff already exists, right? I mean, that, that's that been around forever in these high-speed automated robot robotic you factories. Can, yeah, well, you can see, um, let's see, a plant that, um, that makes tires for airplanes. Okay, you can see either somebody wearing an exoskeleton yeah. or somebody operating a robot from a nearby position. Right, that might use as the drone pilots use a head mounted display, and then they have their little controller here, um, and they make it pick up boxes and you know carry giant tires to trucks. And uh, so that's super possible that's yeah. going to happen. So, and, and that's not something that would necessarily do away with a job, it's just a different kind of machine doing that job. Yeah, yeah. So, what other, what other thing beyond so, so before we get back to Zoom and, and the, the office workplace, which is the thing that everybody's talking about being disrupted. But what yeah. other things might people not be thinking about that 
are going to be replaced with technology in some way or where that that replacement is going to be accelerated because of what right well, like i said let's think about the things that were about to happen as i said telemedicine teleeducation and telework yeah now um you know i think that uh you know vr has a big place in this in the future um but i think that you know this uh, pandemic, uh, like the time AOL broke down in the nineties and, and the whole world came to a stop and people thought they were going to kill themselves. That was in 1996, <laughs> but it made AOL stock go up. Why? Because it demonstrated how important AOL was, yeah. you know, how important the internet was. And so I would say to you, this pandemic, at least perhaps not as visibly because AOL is focused on consumers, but I think this pandemic to everybody inside VR and inside technology and in the investment world suddenly demonstrated the extraordinary value to be found in immersive media. Yeah. Yeah. The search so, is, searches for so virtual it's, reality. In a way, it's bad that we weren't ready for our close up, but the consolation prizes were more relevant than ever. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, a friend of mine, Robbie Van Adam, I want to go to a question here. So, um, so Andrew Barroso asks about like Uber drivers. And so are people going to be afraid to getting into public, into a private car? And is that going to excel? My question then, is that going to accelerate self-driving cars? No, I don't think it's going to accelerate self-driving cars because they're not going to disinfect themselves any better than the driver is going to disinfect the back seat. You're, the question is not just Uber, right? It's about taxis. Yeah. And it's about transportation. I mean, the fact that the Uber drivers are gig workers and have no social safety net is a longer conversation. Yeah. So let's just say that I, I wouldn't focus this exclusively on, on drivers and transportation. I think airlines have that. I think the cruise industry has that. I, I mean, you know, almost everything, you know, having to do with shared public conveniences. Yeah. Is is going to be approached with extreme trepidation. Yeah. Now, I, I will also say that people are very resilient, and they have short memories. So I, I don't think that people will be staying away from those things because they're necessities. Like I said, casual cheap travel, probably something we're not going to see again for a while. Yeah. But it's not like travel is going to go go away. Well, I think it's just look, there's, you know, there's two tomorrows to what will be a new normal for some period of time. There's two there's two tomorrows, right? There's the the tomorrow up until the point there's a vaccine and people can be inoculated or there's herd, herd immunity or whatever. And then there's the tomorrow after that. And I think right. that, you know, and then the question is the first tomorrow, how long is it going to be? Because that's when behavior changes and new behavior sets in. Right. And so. If it's 90 days and they come out with, which they're not, they're not going to have a vaccine in 90 days. Johnson & Johnson said they're hoping to get something out in January that looks promising. So we've got nine months of this, probably where this new behavior is going to set in. Um, and so let's go back. To, so let's talk about education because somebody was just talking about VR and education. How have your students adopted it? How do they feel like it? What how, about it? How's your personal experience as an educator been? Okay, so, so first of all, I mean... All 20 of my students across two sections, and again, two different, very different classes, right? One is, is a production and art class, high, like a high school art class, and the, and the other class is a higher level academic class where they're going to read and, and write, and, and you know, there's a higher level of accountability. It's more work. Um, so two very different kinds of groups of students, but all had the same uh, issue the first day of class. What do you know about VR? How much VR have you done? And some people had never done VR. Some people had done it in the context of location-based, or they had a friend or relative who had it, or their school had it. So <laughs> to the production students, I said, well, we've got to spend the first three weeks of class doing VR, hence having the quests, because otherwise you're going to be like people trying to make a movie who have never seen the movie. Yeah. In my other class, it was kind of less of an issue because the class was about looking at AR and, and learning about it uh, and VR um, rather than making it, right? So you have one making class, one studying class. 
The studying class is the one that's working on the book with me. Um, but what we do in both classes is we jump in and out of VR. Like, oh, let's all go to VR chat and we're there for half an hour and we take it off and we talk or we did a project or we created a room. Um, but, you know, these students aren't that totally more technically savvy than, you know, people in businesses all over the country who are struggling with Zoom. And and so are you, but are they, are you, are you, are you guys, are they doing it from home or are you guys still? Yeah, they're at home. They're doing it from home. So you go from yeah. VR and then, and then what, what, and then you're using, did you say you're using Verbella or what other platform are you using? No, we're, we're using Zoom. Well, Verbella is one of the platforms that we're looking at. I was yeah. in a Verbella uh, event today. It was actually run by a company called Event Farm, which is moving from uh, live conferences to virtual conferences and then expects in the future to be doing a hybrid conferences yeah uh, and they, they've made a deal with Verbella and they've brought a lot of the tools that they use for their offline conferences you know apps and and notifications and stuff like ticketing and so they've brought all that to the platform yeah Le Le uh, Le something Laval Virtual is going to be using Verbella um I think next yeah, week so and yeah I'm going to be I'll be presenting in that for the first time yeah there I mean it's 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 you know there like I said there are 50, 50 different choices wow. um you know Event Farm and Verbella are premium choices yep uh, that is a very good platform and would be applicable for a lot of conferences but it is premium priced yeah there are many many others including Altspace, although you need a head, uh, Altspace, which works perfectly fine on a PC uh, and is totally free. Yeah. What, so so, so uh, let's, let's talk about that because that's one of my questions. So you've got, um, talk about avatars, right? And, yeah. you know, Altspace is very cartoony, though I'm sure everybody's working on more for, photorealistic. I did the HCC, I think you were in there too, the Vive Developers Conference, um, yep. which was done in well, Engage. That was done done on Engage, which is part of uh, Educators in VR. Yeah, and so which and, is a public public company traded in Europe. And that and that you can upload a photo of your face, and it and it maps yeah. it to an avatar, and it feels a little bit more real or present. Like at, yeah, it feels a little more business like. Yeah, um, you get a kind of business like feeling in other apps like Spatial. Uh, does that with your image as well? Yeah, uh, and and alt space, uh, you know, and uh, it's pretty cartoony. You know, it's it's more abstract. It's sort of like rec room in that respect. And so and so in an education scenario and a work scenario, are you going to see? Are we going to see platforms start? Because a hundred fifty platforms is a lot, right? I mean, how how do you segregate? No, a hundred platforms is a lot, Bob. Hundred, wow, <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. So how but, do you, you know? How you've do you got look ten at companies who are doing webinars. You've got six com companies that are doing live streaming. You know, you've got ten companies doing remote collaboration. You have twelve companies in education doing, you know, multi, you know, distributed, shared education spaces. Right. I did an education class that was on Engage, run by a company called Victory XR, which has been pioneering uh, high school and middle school programs. Uh, and they're live. The teacher is live and the students are live and they are quite extraordinary. Yeah. Steve Grubbs. Hope you're on, Steve. Yep. Yeah. Steve is um, Steve is on to something. Yeah. Really. And, the envelope. and I think that, uh, to be honest, Steve's I don't know if Steve's on here. He's a lovely guy and I don't mean to say negative things. But, you know, the thing he was doing was like for Christian homeschoolers and it was a fringe thing in the Midwest of the United States that nobody was ever going to care about. Yeah. Somebody's asking okay. about Facebook Horizon. Now he's on the cutting edge of international education. <laughs> and I'm not even kidding. Yeah. And I'm not even kidding. Yeah. So, so somebody's asking about Facebook Horizon, nice Charlie. Work really hard. But, you know, that's what's happening out there right now. Yeah. Um, somebody on Twitch is asking about Facebook Horizon. What do you know about that? Uh, Facebook Horizons is not, in my opinion, going to be a platform for uh, business interactions. Um, I, I know Rec Room sort of accidentally is. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying you and I can't have interaction in Iran, but I don't think it's going to be optimized for the kinds of things you want to do in a business meeting, like refer to documents, surf the web, uh, use post-it notes, uh, have access to a whiteboard, be able to record the session and have it be 1 million percent secure. Yeah. That's not 
the Facebook horizons. Now, a friend of mine, Robbie Van Adebe, who's a, a guy I've looked up to for years. Very high hopes. Very high hopes for Facebook horizons, and they've got you know hundreds of people working on it. So I'm yeah. sure it's going to be pr pretty pretty exciting, but I just don't think they're thinking about business right now. They're thinking about, let's make it work with a large number of concurrents, yeah, and then we'll see about other stuff. Let's get a billion people in VR, right? That's their, that's their mantra. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the, they, the rest of it is details to them. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think that anybody in the near term that's looking for a, a, a collaboration platform is, is going to get much satisfaction from, from that. Yeah. Now, now a friend of mine, Robbie Van Adebe, who's now in the UK, he posits that when CFOs start looking at their P and L statements and they see the rent and they really focus on rent oh, yeah. rents and how totally. much they can save, totally. is, is totally, this because all you need is access to a conference room? Yeah, and, and maybe not even one in the real world. And so, do you think the you think you think the remote work is going to stick like glue for certain industries? Certainly, yeah. the industry we're in. Does not need office. Knowledge workers. We don't, I mean, look, look at it. I mean, I don't visit you in your office. You and I meet in a restaurant. Yeah. You know, we, we meet in a hallway at AWE. You know, we don't meet in offices. In the olden days, I would go cross town to your office. Yeah. And, and we'd sit there and schmooze and go out to eat. We had all the time in the world. And so the other the other side of that is the reason that we go to conferences, you and I and, and, and most of my friends, like that's where I see them, is to have a drink, eat a meal, have yeah. a hug, you know, and, and we're not getting that in Zoom. We're losing that sense of intimacy. Well, we're never going to have that. I mean, like I said, we will have different things. Yeah. What are they? Any idea? Uh, you know, I mean, for example, you know, I'm doing a book signing at AWE and I'm trying to decide – you know, what platform I want to do it on, you know, should we do it? You know, uh, I mean, I, I might go with Altspace. Yeah. Uh, you know, because look, Altspace, yeah, it's cartoony and doesn't feel very businesslike. Um, so I think that's, you know, so the, um, so it's good for certain types of conferences and not so good for others. Yeah. Um, it's interesting at the uh, event forum event, the one thing I heard from people, everybody was saying, onboarding is too hard. It is. First totally. of all, you can't download an app on a corporate computer. So everybody has to use their own computers. Not everybody has a computer that can handle, you know, again, a lot of people have a pad at home. They have an Android pad. It's not even a full computer. It's good for surfing Amazon and, you know, looking at your calendar, but it's not a real computer. Now, I've always, and, now I've always believed. So, so I, there's, there's a lot of friction with all of these systems, getting people in them and getting them to the right place. Yeah. Now, I've always believed that part of what, part of cell phone adoption, if you go back to the root cause, um, and... And, and cell phone adoption started with the BlackBerry, the original BlackBerry, where people understood that they could right. get email away from their computer. And then they're like, well, if I can get email away from my computer, why can't I get the web away from my computer? And that drove the innate demand for the web browser. The iPhone came out with the web browser. And then everybody was like, oh, my God. And then, and then smartphone um, became a consumer product. But it was all because we were exposed to the core need at work. And so yes. – you know, so my my belief is that we're going to say that see the same thing with VR. I thought it was going to take longer. It's actually going to be compressed now. Now, my, but my quest my question is, locate. Let's go back to location based VR, which you know you and I both have real doubts about. How is that going to play out? It, yeah. You know, will people be able? Will people have VR headsets that they can bring to locations and and do things together? Or is that just a pipe dream? that's you want to talk about friction? That's a lot of friction. It is, yeah. You know, and so, uh, you know, when you have world scale, free roaming multiplayer VR in your home, <laughs> in your backyard with your kids and everybody else, what does a VR arcade have to offer you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I will say this. There's, for example, premium experiences in theme park settings. Um, you know, if you did Dreamscape. You know, at Disneyland, the problem with Dreamscape, as wonderful as it is, is there's zero repeatability. Yeah. So it can only be in venues where there's a lot of new traffic, not repeat traffic. Yeah. And that is the problem with going into the local movie theater. 
it's all repeat traffic. It's all people who live around there. So great, yeah. So they may show up there. It's a familiar place. They're happy to go and and even make it a destination, but they're only going there once. Yeah. So, you know, if you ask me which is a better business, um, you know, uh, um, uh, let's say Virtuix Omni, four-player arena, VR arena, um, you know, or, or Dreamscape, well, you know, $80,000 virtual million dollar dreamscape Virtuix wins by a score of a hundred to nothing Yeah, <laughs> because there is no repeatability in dreamscape as wonderful as it is. Yeah. There's no repeatability in Disneyland, Yeah, right? You are fully satisfied after your hundred and thirty dollar day at Disneyland, you're completely satisfied. You don't feel like I want to go back there tomorrow and do it again. Yeah, you're satisfied by six o'clock, but you feel like you have to stay till ten because you paid so much money. Right, right. Say exactly. <laughs> so, so, so that's my point. So, so I think that that's the problem is that the best um, VR um, is is it repeatable, and the other VR you can have at home. Yeah. So I I think that uh, I don't think anybody is going to be putting on headsets anytime soon. Like I said. And, and I mean, yes, we can make a big show of cleaning them and everything, but I just think that it's like the handshake. Are people going to go back to doing the handshake? I think people, I mean, look, people will put them on if they want it or not. But I think at least at first, there's going to be a, e you know what? <laughs> yeah. Not, not feeling, I mean, I think you'll hear people just say, I don't feel comfortable with that. Yeah. And people will totally understand. I mean, we're going to see a whole generation of people who are not going to be super germ phobic. They're going to be wearing masks in, in public for the next 30 years. Yeah, bank robbers are loving this. So, Nate, I mean, you're going to go to New York City or San Francisco and walk down the street and everybody will be wearing a mask and not just for the next year, but forever. Yeah. So and again, some people will be wearing them forever. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the prognosis for location based VR is uh, terrible in the near term because it's going to be the last business like movie theaters that are allowed to come back. Once it's allowed to come back, like movie theaters, we will have to see if people want it anymore. Yeah. You know, as I said, it's about to happen, like the end of movie theaters may be accelerated. Yeah. Things that were about to happen, like the end of retail, may be accelerated. I. I you know, I think if Macy's stays open, it's only because the government is paying them to stay open and keep their employees employed rather than the government having to pay those employees. Yeah. So, so, so Nate but Gerard, I think there's real business for them. Nate Gerard on Twitch um, asks, so is this the best time to get into VR because the demand's about to skyrocket? Yes. Yes. I mean, it depends what you do. Right. So I know it's not a good time to open a VR game, <laughs> but, um, you know, if you have something to do with um, remote collaboration, I mean, there's a hundred companies out there. They're all hiring. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, and every company that's got a VR product right now, if they're not, they should be looking at how to make it multiplayer. Yeah. But, you know, all in anticipation for devices that we have yet to see. So somebody's asking about app speaking of devices we've yet to see. Somebody's asking about Apple's mystery AR device. Now rumor is they're going to buy Next VR. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, which is the company that did was doing VR live events and sporting events. Uh, Next VR, well, Next VR is better than I thought it would be, but not something I felt compelled to do again and again. So kudos to them for kind of figuring out how to do it with the technology we have today. Yeah. Um but I don't know how much of a business it is. I think it's a little bit like Microsoft acquiring Altspace. It's good to keep working on it. It's good to, you know, it's a company that is well positioned to have a breakthrough. Um, so I, as Altspace was. So I think that was Microsoft's rationale. And, and I think that may be what's at work here as well. Because I don't think that's a very big piece of the puzzle for Apple. 
Um, well, you know, I mean, I think let's not change, get too excited million. by Apple because they're going to announce something in 2022. We're going to see it in 2023. There aren't going to be that many. It's going to be honking expensive. It'll do one or two things really, really well and not much else. It won't be super mobile. It won't be a, you know, all day, every day thing. But, you know, like the smartphone, like the iPod became the iPhone, it will iterate itself into relevancy and popularity. But, you know, this could take two, three, four years, depending on the iteration, how frequent the iterations are and and how people feel about what it does and if it's worth it. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people will get it because it'll be a premium medium play, media player. OK, we know that. Yeah. You know, world's best device for watching television. <laughs> right? it, it disrupt television. I don't know. But uh, I think it's going to be pretty amazing and, and pretty disruptive. And at first, not, and, you know, like the watch. I mean, you know, I love to do this at tech conferences, right? Who's wearing an Apple watch? Wait. Like, like 3% of the people in the audience. So that's, that's going to be the headset. Yeah. Or what watch was introduced four or five years ago. Yeah. So yeah. that's going to be headsets. Yeah. That's going to well, be headsets. Watch I'll should be much bigger. It's, Way cool. My wife loves her watch. Yeah, I think the I I think that it's the um they they play the they have the money to play the long game though, right? And yeah. and they often do things that people just don't get. I and, I love going back. Go, also, they go last a lot. I mean, I bought an MP an MP3 player in 1999 that I threw out in 2001 when the when I got an iPod. Yeah. You know, so I think that, that that's going to happen to a lot of devices that were supposedly consumer devices, including, you know, the, the Quest that I like so much is, you know, two years away from the garbage can. Yeah. Yeah. It's also kind of falling apart under under heavy use. <laughs> Although that also happened to my first Vive headset. So <laughs> you're a he um, you're a power user. I, I mean, I don't consider like an hour a day a power user, but. So yeah, well, I use it a lot. I want to thank I want to thank you first of all, Charlie, for for taking the time out of what must be a very busy schedule. Um. Well, you know, it's I mean, it's just an exciting time. I I, I hate to um, to gloat on other people's misery, but I I think this has been good for VR. I think it's potentially good for humanity if we can lower our carbon footprint and. Um, you know, tamp down the hysteria of running back and forth between home and work and, you know, here in Australia and, uh, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe the world will be a better place because of it. But, you know, everything, un unfortunately, when you get to be our age, you know that everything is a double-sided coin and there is no right and wrong. And sometimes the best intentions, like freeing the internet from the horrible gatekeepers, have the worst results. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of trepidation about these things um, because I've been so wrong in the. Yeah. You know, and uh, and, you know, one thing I, I, you know, caution everybody about is and and, you know, unfortunately, I don't practice what I preach because for my business, I need to live out loud. But I think people should be a lot more concerned about their privacy from now on. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If they are now, they ought to go correct it. Um, um, unless you want someone like Donald Trump to potentially know everything about you. Yeah, I think I think that that's going to get a lot more attention in the coming in the coming months. There, we've you know that that whole privacy has been eroded over the last decade. But, but I think we kind of threw it away too when this all started. Like, fuck, I don't care about privacy. I just want to get my work done. Yep. You know, and then and then of course it comes out. Oh my God, Zoom is super insecure. Yeah, <laughs> like every conversation has been recorded and routed uh, through Chinese uh, servers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, you know, I mean, we're just a, a very resilient and stupid race. What can I say? And and uh, I know this for a fact because I'm among the worst of them. But it's great hanging out with you. We always have fun when we do. I, show. I could do these every day. I feel like so. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you for taking the time. I want to thank everybody. We've had a great crowd. The audience engagement has been um, phenomenal. And awesome. I, want to, I want to thank everybody for joining and sending us your questions, sending us your comments. Um, we will. Peter Van Lugenhagen was asking if we're going to be re, um, posting this. We'll be posting this. 
Um, all of my live interviews and all the being virtual shows will be posted up on bobcooney.com this week. Um, we'll also have some of them up on YouTube. I'm having a little battle with YouTube right now over um, over some things. Um, we'll have the, I have them on Vimeo as well. They'll be on Facebook. We're streaming this live to four different platforms and about seven different pages. So um, really appreciate your audience and um, the technology has been great. By the way, Restream IO, thank you for existing. You've been amazing. Amazing Ecam Live, the studio suite we're using has been amazing. Um, and uh, and we'll have a new show live on Friday in Americas and Europe. Saturday morning in Australia and Asia. We'll be um, talking some more about the future of work and collaboration. Um, we'll also be talking about some new AAA games coming out in VR. Project A or, uh, Half Life Alice has been amazing. Alex, sorry. Um, I've really enjoyed it. So we'll be talking about some more AAA games coming um, and some news of what's happening in the world of virtual, which is no longer just virtual reality. It's, it's becoming everything. So um, follow Charlie Twink, Charlie Fink on Twitter, um, at Charlie Fink. That's where you do most of your social media. Is that right, Charlie? Yeah. Yes. And I'm also on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, I, I love my followers. And um, certainly it's the best way to find out about books and uh, my Friday column and uh, any features that I write or uh, – uh, any snarky things I have to say about just about anything. Awesome. So, all right. So we're going to do, uh, in, in light of no more handshakes, we'll do the Howie Mandel virtual fist bump this time. Boom. Howie was way <laughs> before his time. <laughs> and um, I look forward to seeing you on Twitter and hopefully some point in the future uh, and we'll do a real hug again. All right. Well, Kylie, tell, and thank you, Kylie, for the great introduction. Um, uh, my, my family was hugely entertained. Any, but, any opportunity to hop on pop. If you guys didn't, uh, didn't see that, go back and watch the beginning of the show and you'll see, uh, we did a little bit of a, of a, of a Brady Bunch intro and, uh, Kylie has put it out on social media. So follow Charlie Fink yeah, and thank you. All right, guys. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Charlie. We're going to go ahead and play that. We're going to play that as an outro one more time for those of, the, those of you that weren't there. Um, Drop stay out. Stay tuned. Thumbs up. And we'll see you soon. Love you, Charlie. Thanks.